Last time on Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> when we last left our heroes, James and Jesse had both suffered difficult losses in Fall Arbor and Lava Ridge. Jesse's Wismer was unable to overcome its stage fright and is now too afraid to leave its Pokeball. And James was absolutely wiped out by the Elite Four level gym leader, Mr. Moore. But there's no time to dwell on the losses. Their mission is too important. They need to bounce back and continue their journey to collect 8 badges and 5 ribbons to then save their stolen Pokemon from Team Rocket. James, Jesse, and Meowth leave Lava Ridge without a badge, but with their spirits unbroken. The journey continues. On their way to Rebello Town for Jesse's next contest, our lovable trio take a break at the nearby Lake May. They're there just in time for the May Festival, and it's exactly what they need to relax and recuperate after their losses. As the festival begins, music flows through the air, and everyone can't help but become intoxicated with it. The only thing missing from the festival are the stars! The Firefly Pokémon Illumise and Volbeat are meant to come out on nights like this and light up the festival, but none are appearing. That's very odd, and the crowds of people are beginning to get uneasy. Could the increased Team Rocket activity in Hoenn be scaring away even the wild Pokémon? There have been some Team Rocket sightings in the area, and sometimes at night, locals can hear the sounds of a monster. So perhaps the Volbeat and Illumis are too afraid to leave the forest. As the festival waits, James remembers that they have a tool that could help. He pulls out one of the flutes he and Jesse won back at the Flute Cup. The White Flute, when played by James, calls nearby wild Pokémon to them. All of the Volbeat and Illumis hear the sound and leave the safety of the forest to light up the lake. The sight is absolutely awe-inspiring. Luckily, Team Rocket doesn't show up this time to ruin the festivities. After an evening of food, dance, music, and beautiful light displays, our trio wanders through the forest. As they do so, James swears he can hear something near the lake's opposite shore. A familiar roar, like the ones locals say often precedes a Team Rocket attack. James runs after it, with Jesse and Meowth following after. But whatever made that roar, whether Team Rocket or something else, it's long gone. However, the trio do come across an Illumise and Volbeat who didn't leave the forest with the others and who are… crying? Meowth approaches them and asks them what's wrong. You see, all of the Illumise and Volbeat in this area are supposed to migrate to the other side of Hoenn. These two, however, are much older than the others, and their wings are too weak to make such a long journey. After years spent looking for the perfect mate, to have finally found one and not be able to migrate, the sadness is overwhelming for them. James and Jesse can't stand to see the two so sad, and they offer to help. James and Jesse offer to catch both of them and carry them to the other side of Hoenn for them. They promise to release them when the two are ready to return to the wild and begin their new lives together. Volbeat and Illumis are stunned by the kind offer from the humans. It's exactly what they need. Volbeat and Illumis agree and join Jesse and James's team, promising to help the humans any way they can as they journey to their new home across Hoenn. After the emotional but magical time at Lake May, the trio continue their journey. They have more reason than ever to keep moving forward. After passing through the Forbidden Forest and Mount Kirikiri, the trio arrive in Rubello Town. Jesse enters her first contest after her loss in Fall Arbor. Knowing Wismer's fear now, she won't make him do anything he doesn't want to. Instead, for the appeals stage, Jesse decides to use Volbeat. The old bug type turns out to be a natural-born performer. Jesse tells him to imagine every person in the audience is the love of his life, Illumis. And this works! He performs like love is on the line and does a dazzling display using Signal Beam to create an Illumise in the air using light. Jesse not only qualifies for the battle stage, but gets the highest score amongst all of the appeals. Talk about a comeback. Volbeat has no trouble in the quarterfinals after it defeats a coordinator's Mawile using Signal Beam and Tackle, and Mawile's coordinator is visibly angry to have lost against Volbeat so easily. He actually has to be escorted out of the arena by security. What a sore loser. In the semifinals, Spoink makes his battle debut against a coordinator's Masquerade. Even though he has a tight disadvantage, this doesn't seem to bother Spoink at all. He doesn't back down or flinch, and charges his cute self towards the bug type. Using a unique combination of Psy Wave and Psy Beam, Spoink absolutely destroys Masquerade. In the finals, Jesse faces off against a coordinator called Mr. Grimm, who will one day give up Pokemon coordinating at the behest of his wife. Against his Dusclops, Jesse takes a risk and sends out Spoink once more. 
He did so well against Masquerade, she has complete trust in him. The battle looks very evenly matched at first, with both exchanging powerful attacks. But Dusclops is able to clip Spoink with a Nightshade, which doesn't do too much damage, but it does knock Spoink's pearl off of his head. Usually when a Spoink loses its pearl, it becomes very sleepy. But this Spoink isn't like others. The second Spoink's pearl is knocked off, his eyes glow red with anger. He doesn't get sleepy, he gets furious. In his anger, Spoink fires off an extremely powerful Shadow Ball and defeats Mr. Grimm's Dusclops in an instant. With a victorious shout, Spoink begins to glow at center stage. After his battles against Team Rocket and his intense victory here, Spoink is evolving. He evolves into Grumpig, and while he may be bigger, he's still the cute little warrior everyone knows and loves. Thanks to Jessie's two newest Pokemon, she wins her fourth contest ribbon, and everyone learns a valuable lesson. Do not touch Grumpig's pearls. Riding high on her victory, the trio leaves the arena in good spirits, but they hear an argument going on near the side exit of the arena. The coordinator who Jessie defeated in the quarterfinals is yelling at his Mawile. How could you lose so easily to some stupid bug? When I caught you, I expected a steel type to be a little tougher. You're pathetic. Hey, what the heck do you think you're doing? Jesse yells at the coordinator. He goes to shove his own Mawile before Jesse knocks him down herself. I literally encountered criminals trying to steal Pokemon outside arenas, yet you are still the worst person I've ever met at a contest. You don't deserve a Pokemon like Mawile. But Jesse's words fall on deaf ears, and Mawile's trainer, let's call him Stu, last name Pid, chooses to release her in frustration. Go on, go be someone else's problem. And Stu leaves the area, with Jesse fuming behind him. She wants to run after him and beat him to a pulp, but seeing the small Mawile crying alone behind her, she instead turns to care for her. Ignore everything he said. You're not pathetic at all. Mawile's mood brightens just a little, but Jesse can tell she's still very shaken. She couldn't possibly leave Mawile alone. What do you say you come with us? Mawile's a little nervous, but can tell that there's something different about Jessie. She agrees and accepts the Pokeball Jessie offers her. Wanting to add Mawile to her team right away, Jessie decides to send Wismer to James's grandparents. Wismer still hasn't left his Pokeball since losing the Fall Arbor contest from Stage Fright, and some time away from their journey amongst their other Pokemon may help him relax and recover. Passing the Hoenn Weather Institute, the trio heads into Fortree for James's next gym battle. But before that, they attend the city's famous Feather Carnival. They enjoy food, fun, games, and James is encountered by an old friend. The Magikarp salesman he met after missing the SSN in Vermilion City is here selling his wares once again. As James approaches him, the salesman gets worried that he's going to get mad at him for selling him such a weak Pokemon back then. But James feels the opposite. He thanks the man for selling him what ultimately became one of his strongest Pokemon, and a really close friend. He almost tears up remembering Gyarados, and when he closes his eyes, he can still hear his soothing roar. James asks the salesman if he has anything exciting, and he tells James he has basically the Hoenn version of Magikarp, a Feebas. He tells James he will give him a good deal this time, and James jumps at the chance. He purchases a Feebas, and sends her straight to his grandparents where she can hang out with Lickitung and Slowpoke. The next day, they head to the Fortree Gym, and James faces off against the flying-type specialist, Vladimir. Against the gym leader who will one day retire, move to Lily Cove, and teach Ash about Aerial Ace, James has a 3-on-3 three -three battle. Vladimir sends out Pidgeotto, and James sends out Illumise. Illumise may be new to battling with James, but does very well. A combination of Tackle and Silver Wind does a lot of damage, but unfortunately, Pidgeotto is able to do just as much damage with Aerial Ace. Both Pokemon are knocked out at the same time, turning this battle into a two-on-two. -two. Jesse's Volby jumps out of its Pokeball and nearly attacks the Pidgeotto himself, but uh, luckily Meowth is able to hold him back. Vladimir then sends out his Swellow, and James sends out Curlia. Though Curlia does some damage with Psybeam, Swellow's aerial advantage allows it to dodge most attacks easily, and also gets behind Curlia to knock her out with a powerful aerial ace. James is down to his last Pokemon, and after seeing how big of an advantage Vladimir's flying types have here, he gets an idea. A little something he's been working on for just such an occasion. James sends out Chimecho. 
Though the little psychic type doesn't seem like much of a battler, Vladimir underestimating them is also part of the plan. He orders Swellow to attack with Aerial Ace, but as the flying type soars down towards Chime Echo, James orders them to use Gravity. The unexpected move forces Swellow to become grounded, and he slams into the arena floor with a massive crash. Without the ability to fly and avoid attacks, Swellow is helpless, and Chimaco knocks it out with Wrath. Vladimir is surprised to see James's strategy, but is confident in his ace, and sends out Tropius. While Chimaco is hit directly with a body slam and paralyzed, it's nothing a heal bell can't fix. With a well-timed gravity, Tropius is as vulnerable as Swellow was, and Chimeco knocks her out with Astonish and Double Edge. Thanks to the unexpected powerhouse of Chimeco, James wins and earns his fourth badge, the Feather Badge. After leaving Fortree, our trio sees signs for a new high-tech city being constructed nearby called La Rousse City, but as they haven't constructed a gym yet, there's no reason to go out of their way to check it out. Talking with some trainers near the Safari Zone, James hears that there's a ghost-type gym somewhere between Fortree and Lily Cove. But this next gym is unique, as the leader isn't in a nearby town, but training with and against the ghost types of Mount Pyre. The gym leader is waiting near the summit for challengers brave enough to search through the haunted area for a battle, and James isn't turning away from any challenge with his friends on the line. The trio heads to Mount Pyre, and though some ghost types do mess with them during the trek up, they eventually come face to face with the gym leader, the One Day Elite Four member, Phoebe. She's impressed that the ghost types of the area didn't scare him away, and happily accepts his request for a battle. Little does Phoebe know, James has a bit of experience with spooky ghost types. Against Phoebe, James sends out Cacnea to face her Dusclops. Though Dusclops is able to burn Cacnea with Will-O-Wisp, she's able to defeat the ghost type with a super effective feint attack. But the burn really holds her back, and against Phoebe's second Pokemon, Banette, Cacnea is knocked out by Shadow Ball. James sends out Illumise, and while she's able to use Confuse Ray and Protect to force Banette to damage itself once, it's also able to defeat her with a perfectly aimed Shadow Ball to Volbeat's intense anger. James sends out Growly, hoping the puppy Pokemon can come in clutch and defeat two of Phoebe's Pokemon. And when she orders Banette to use Feint Attack, the very move Cacnea used to defeat Dusclops, Phoebe inadvertently falls right into James's trap. Thanks to Growly's ability Justified, he gets an attack boost that helps Flare Blitz take out Banette with ease. Then, against Phoebe's last Pokemon Sableye, Growly holds nothing back. This isn't his first battle against a Sableye, and he uses Fire Blast to knock away a Shadow Ball before taking out the Ghost type with a powered up Flare Blitz. Remembering his fight with Blinky and Cassidy's Sableye was all the fuel he needed to win. The good boy absolutely wrecked Phoebe's last two Pokemon, and James is given his fifth badge, the Spirit Badge. Jessie's next contest is in Lily Cove, which is not too far from Mount Pyre, and with four ribbons in her case, this could be her last contest in Hoenn. If she wins here, she will have all the ribbons needed to qualify for the Grand Festival. Jessie and her team are super prepared to win, and they enter the arena in Lily Cove with victory on their mind. Mawile takes center stage for the appeals, and motivated by the desire to rise above that awful trainer who abandoned her, Mawile performs beautifully. She creates a dazzling display using Swords Dance and Iron Defense, showcasing what power she has when maxing out her attack and defense. Casey, a coordinator Jesse has competed with in the past, also makes it past the appeals stage. Jesse's gonna congratulate her in the locker room, but as she goes to shake her hand, Casey freaks out and runs away. She must have seen something, or someone, she didn't like. Jesse thinks it was awfully weird for her to just forfeit like that, but she doesn't have much time to think about it, as her old friend Aston approaches her to say hi. He was in the area with his friend, and he wants Jesse to meet him after the contest. Apparently, Aston and his new friend have a favor to ask Jesse and James, but that'll have to wait till after the contest. Jesse blazes past the quarter and semi finals thanks to Wobbuffet's Mirror Coats and to Viper's Poison Tails. But as high as Jesse is flying, her heart sinks when she sees who her opponent is in the finals. The trainer who she watched win the Fall Arbor contest, Wallace, the water type specialist. Jesse sends out Mawile to face off against Wallace's Swampert. 
The battle initially goes in Jesse's favor. While Swampert does damage with Earthquake, Mawile's able to mitigate it by using Iron Defense. But even after a sword stance, an Iron Head barely does any damage to Swampert. Without a move that the water and ground type can't resist, even with maxed out stats, Mawile can't defeat Swampert. Swampert even shows off its versatility by doing heavy damage with an unexpected Iron Tail against the Steel type. Mawile struggles till the last second, never succumbing to the damage and fainting, but when the result is left to the judges, they make a quick decision. The battle was clearly Wallace and Swampert's. Mawile is in tears after losing against Wallace. Her mind flashes back to how her last trainer treated her and is terrified that Jessie is also going to yell at her and abandon her. Before Jessie can put Mawile back in her Pokeball, the little steel type runs into the locker rooms, crying. Jessie chases after her and doesn't hesitate to hold Mawile in her arms. You did amazing today, Mawile. I'm so proud of you, is all Jessie says as she rocks back and forth until Mawile calms down. She can tell Mawile was thinking back to how her old trainer treated her, but Jessie would never, could never do something so awful. Remembering all she's been through with her Pokemon in her adventures, like with Arbok, Sneasel, Cloyster, Wismer, and everyone else, Jessie could never hurt Mawile. In time, she calms down, with Mawile feeling more secure in her place with Jessie. The two may not have won the Lily Cove contest, but they leave the arena closer than ever before. Jesse tries to find Aston after the contest to meet his mystery friend and hear what he wanted to ask her, but she can't find him. Huh. First Casey disappears, and now Aston and his friend? What a weird coincidence! Jesse returns Mawile to her Pokeball and meets back up with James and Meowth. Just as the trio is about to leave Lily Cove, they run into a woman in the streets carrying a bunch of bags. She apologizes and introduces herself as Glacia. Apparently, she just retired as a gym leader here and is heading to travel the world to become stronger so she can one day return to become a member of the Elite Four. James jumps at the chance for an unexpected gym battle and asks her if she still happens to have any badges left. She says yes, she still has one, but she was hoping to save it as a keepsake from her time as a gym leader. James begs her to battle him, saying that he's running out of time to get all eight badges. Glacia can see the passion in James's eyes, and it reminds her why she wanted to become a gym leader in the first place. She agrees, and decides that James is the perfect person to have her final gym battle with. Returning to the closed Delily Cove gym, Glacia opens it back up and she and James have a two-on-two -two battle. Growly is sent in to battle Glacia's Glalie, and everyone assumes the plucky little fire type will have an easy victory. But after a fire blast injures Glalie, Growly gets frozen solid by an ice beam. James has no choice and switches Growly out for Vigoroth. The battle is surprisingly close despite Glalie being damaged, but ultimately Vigoroth comes out on top using a super effective focus punch. Next up is Glacia's ace, Walrein, and despite being damaged by another focus punch, Walrein is able to defeat Vigoroth using sheer cold. James is as good as defeated, as he's got no choice but to send out the frozen Growly. Glacia can't help but laugh a little, and asks James if he would prefer to forfeit rather than watch his Pokemon damaged by her Walrein, and James considers it for less than a second, but instead of answering her, he just smirks. Glacia doesn't understand what Growly has an inner fire. Knowing this battle is on his shoulders, and that the fate of his friends could be too, Growly's body heats up to volcanic temperatures. He explosively bursts through the ice, and the cocky Walrein is stunned. The water ice type is too shocked to move, and can't dodge Growly's unexpected attack. Inspired by the Iron Tail used to defeat Jesse in the recent contest, Growly comes in clutch with a newly learned Iron Tail himself. He defeats Glacia's ace Walrein against all odds with a single powerful attack. Glacia's as stunned as her Pokemon was, and realizes that she still has a lot to learn if she wishes to become a member of the Elite Four. James is awarded his sixth badge, the Hail Badge. He thanks Glacia immensely for letting him fight her, and the trio wave goodbye to her as she leaves Hoenn. One day, after years of training and traveling, she will return to Hoenn and finally become a member of the Elite Four. Booking passage on a ferry that makes a few stops at Bomba, Maisie, and Wazoo Island, the trio finally end up in Sutopolis City. It's an absolutely gorgeous place, and they can't help but take some time to explore the city and relax. After some time, James and Jesse decide to call his grandparents and check in on their Pokemon. 
James's Lickitung and Jesse's Yanmar are doing great, and Whisper has finally come out of his Pokeball and is doing much better. Apparently, James's Slowpoke has been spending a lot of time with both Wismer and Feebas, helping both build up their confidence and skills. James's grandparents insist that there's something special about this Slowpoke, and after working with the seemingly lazy looking Pokemon, Feebas flops into screen, and thanks to Meowth's translation, James learns that she really wants to battle. James agrees, and sends Chimecho to have a break, and adds Feebas to his team. Finally ready to take on the Sutopolis Gym, James challenges the leader Juan to a battle. It will be a 3 on 3 fight. James sends out Cacnea to face off against Juan's Love Disc. With the type advantage and the, let's say, not at all intimidating look of Love Disc, James thinks this first battle is in the bag. And Pokemon battles just love checking a person's overconfidence, don't they? Cacnea gets a hit in with Needle Arm, but after a sweet kiss from Love Disc confuses her, Cacnea's a sitting duck to Water Pulse after Water Pulse. Cacnea is unexpectedly beaten by the heart shaped kissing fish. Not to be confused with the non heart shaped kissing fish Pokemon. James is taken aback by the loss, but his experience helps him shake it off quickly, and with a clear mind, he makes a bold choice. James sends out Feebas. Feebas vs. Love Disc doesn't sound like it's gonna be an epic battle, but let me assure you, it is. It's so intense, so mind-boggling, so overwhelmingly powerful that I cannot even show it to you now. Like, I wish you could see it, but it would melt your faces off. Ultimately, in addition to the destruction of half of the arena, Feebas is able to defeat Love Disc. Just barely. And with its debut performance and first victory comes a worthy reward. Feebas glows white light and evolves into the most beautiful Pokemon ever, Milotic. With a flick of its tail, it showers the arena in shimmering water, and if this were a contest, that would have been enough to win the appeal stage. With so much newfound power and moves, Juan isn't ready for Milotic. Using a combination of Twister and Water Pulse, she beautifully and effortlessly defeats Juan's Whiskash and his Crawdaunt. Milotic proves to Juan, James, and anyone watching, she is queen of the water Pokemon, and don't you forget it. Taking a ferry, oh my god, so many ferries, past Wales Island, the gang ends up in Purika City, where Jessie's last chance is waiting for her. If she doesn't win her fifth ribbon here, she won't qualify for the Grand Festival. She enters the massive Purika Contest Hall, heavy with anticipation. As she sits in the coordinator waiting area, planning her strategy, a nearby attendant tells her that she has a call. Apparently, James's grandparents have been having some issues with Wismer. The little Pokemon has been training like crazy and will not calm down until Jessie re-adds him to her team. She can see the determination he has and decides to put all of her faith in him. Jessie replaces Mawile, who could use a little rest after the emotional showing in Lily Cove, and adds Wismer back to her team. Though Jessie's reluctant to allow it, Wismer insists on being used in the contest. Whatever training Wismer's been doing with her and James's Pokemon has done wonders to his confidence. There's a fire in his eyes, and Jessie proudly sends out Wismer for the appeals stage. And standing there, in front of a packed house, Wismer hesitates. All of the fear he had back in Fall Arbor rushes back. Like a cold wind, being on stage sends shivers down Wismer's back. But Wismer shakes his head and remembers the advice Slowpoke gave him. The world won't turn to ash if you fail, so don't worry about it. Knowing that takes a lot of the pressure off. Wismer creates a dazzling display using an unexpected hyper voice. Jesse was expecting just a screech, but hyper voice takes everyone by surprise, and Jesse qualifies for the battle stage. There's a big voice in that small Pokemon. So impressed he was able to get over his stage fright, Jesse uses Wismer for her quarterfinals battle. Against a coordinator named Sheridan, who will one day become a Pokemon cheerleader, Wismer faces off against Roselia. Though Roselia uses aromatherapy to cure an unexpected paralysis from Wismer's Thunder Punch, the tiny normal type is able to defeat the grass type using its hyper voice. Wismer wins its first battle ever, and with tears of joy in its eyes, knowing it didn't let Jesse down, Wismer begins to glow. In a triumphant pose, Wismer evolves into Loud Red. With a newfound power as Loud Red, Jessie's confident entering the semifinals. She faces off against a trainer who is originally from Johto, named Will. 
Will has also won four ribbons, and apparently hasn't lost a battle yet, but today, all that will change. Jessie isn't intimidated by Will's reputation, like she was with Wallace. He sends out Zatu, and she sticks with Loud Red. The battle's very evenly matched, with the two swapping Psybeams and Hyper Voices, both doing as much damage as they take. It's no surprise Will is destined to join the Elite Four in Johto, as he makes Jessie and Loud Red fight for each and every point. By using a super effective Astonish, Loud Red is able to cause Zatu to flinch, and in that moment, lands one final Hyper Voice. Loud Red knocks out Zatu, winning its second battle, and against a very powerful coordinator too. And shouting in victory, Loud Red shines white light? Again? The audience and Jesse alike are stunned. Loud Red evolves for the second time in just as many battles into Exploud. When Wismer entered the arena, he was a tiny and shy Pokemon, but as he enters the finals, he's one of the biggest, strongest, loudest Pokemon around. And in the finals, Exploud has no trouble at all. The semi finals battle against Will was much more difficult and Exploud defeats a trainer's shift tree using a combination of Hyper Voice and a newly learned Hyper Beam. Jesse and Exploud are the undeniable winners of the Purika contest, and that means Jesse earns her fifth ribbon. She did it! And all thanks to the newest powerhouse addition to her team, Exploud. With his strength and newfound confidence, Jesse is closer than ever to winning the Grand Festival and saving her friends from Team Rocket. Just as Jesse had only one shot left in Purika, James realizes that his last shot awaits him in Moss Deep. Flannery's grandfather, Mr. Moore, who defeated James back in Lava Ridge, should still be in Moss Deep for the test launches of the new shuttle. While James might be able to find a gym elsewhere to get his 8th badge, he feels compelled to have this rematch. If he can't defeat Mr. Moore, would he really be strong enough to save his friends? Jesse and Meowth support James' decision, knowing there's no changing his mind once it's made up. The trio travel to Moss Deep, and once there, head straight to the launch station where Mr. Moore is. The gym leader recognizes James immediately, and admits he isn't shocked to see him again. He could tell from their first battle that James was a very determined young man, and would never be able to rest until they faced off again. In the outskirts of Moss Deep, Mr. Moore and James have their rematch, and with how close the registration deadline is for the Evergrande conference, this is James' last shot to qualify. It's now or never. James sends out Milotic, and Mr. Moore sends out Torkoal, the very Pokemon that single-handedly wiped out James' team the first time. But James is much more prepared this time. Torkoal tries to power up its Fire-type attacks by using Sunny Day, but Milotic counters it with Rain Dance. Torkoal burns Milotic with Flamethrower, but Milotic uses Refresh to remove the burn. Mr. Moore can tell James has grown a lot as a trainer, and he put a lot of thought into this battle. And he's right, James has been devising strategies to defeat Mr. Moore ever since losing to him. There's too much on the line for him to slack off. Though Torkoal was once able to defeat James all on his own, it is defeated by a single, rain-boosted water pulse by Milotic. Mr. Moore is shocked to have lost to Torkoal. It's been some time since Torkoal lost to anyone, but as an Elite Four level gym leader, he doesn't flinch at the loss. He sends out Camera up next. James initially thinks this is a terrible choice. Milotic's Water Pulse is four times effective against the Fire and Ground type, but Mr. Moore is not to be underestimated. He orders Camera up to use Attract. The beautiful Milotic is overwhelmed by Camera up's handsomeness and in that delay, he's able to hit her with an eruption. Just as it seems like Milotic is done for, she's able to shake off the Attract. Milotic cannot be distracted by something as simple as Attract. She uses Water Pulse, defeating Camerupt in a single hit. Mr. Moore is down to his last Pokemon, which is not something he's had to deal with for years. But being backed into a corner has got him more fired up than ever. He sends out his Ace, Typhlosion. As powerful as Milotic is, she's undeniably weakened from the first two battles. After the Fire-type dodges a Water Pulse, he defeats Milotic with a Solar Beam. James sends out Vigoroth next. Though Vigoroth is able to get in a Focus Punch against Typhlosion, the Fire-type is able to take out the Sloth Pokémon with a combination of Flame Wheel and Flame Thrower. James is down to his last Pokémon, and he knows exactly who to choose. The very Pokémon that James bet his entire journey on in his first battle with Mr. Moore. James sends out Curlia. Typhlosion dodges Curlia's Psybeams with ease, and after she uses Double Team to try and trick the Fire-type, Mr. Moore gets around this move just like he did the first time, with Eruption. 
the battlefield is coated with lava, destroying all of Curlia's double team clones and knocking her back. Hurt intensely by such a powerful attack, Curlia falls over, nearly fainting. It all feels far too familiar. Hurt by eruption, Mr. Moore's unshaken confidence, and with Curlia being the only thing standing between victory and defeat, everything's on the line. And this time, she won't let James down. Curlia glows bright white and evolves into Gardevoir. Mr. Moore smirks at James. Your Pokemon evolving didn't win you the battle last time, so don't think it will matter now. But James knows that this is nothing like last time. Gardevoir's expression is telling James one thing. She will not lose. Mr. Moore orders Typhlosion to use Eruption once more, but Gardevoir uses Protect to avoid the damage. She then uses Calm Mind, showcasing to the gym leader that nothing he does will dampen her spirits. Mr. Moore begins to sweat for the first time. This could actually be enough. He panics and orders Typhlosion to use Eruption again, but once more Gardevoir uses Protect. Eruption is clearly getting weaker with each hit. Gardevoir uses Calm Mind once more, and everyone watching can tell this battle is over. Typhlosion's attack is weak, and Gardevoir is stronger and more determined than ever. James orders her to use a new move, Stored Power. Every boost gained from her Calm Mind fuels the attack, and Typhlosion is enveloped in a beam of pink radiant light. James and Mr. Moore shield their eyes from the attack, but when the light dissipates, the battle is over. Typhlosion lays fainted, and Gardevoir stands tall. James has won! Mr. Moore can't believe it, but seeing the joy and strength in James and Gardevoir's eyes, he realizes there's no one better to have bested him. You really earned this badge, he says to James, and gives him his eighth and final badge, the Heat Badge. And Mr. Moore doesn't leave empty-handed either. As James continues his journey, the gym leader realizes it might be getting time for him to move on too. He vows to begin helping his granddaughter train to take over for him, and maybe now he will finally take up the League's offer to join the Elite Four. Holding cases filled to the brim with badges and ribbons, James and Jesse have done it. They've qualified to compete in the Evergrande Conference and the Grand Festival. As excited as they are to accomplish this, it means more to know that saving their Pokémon is just a few victories away. If Butch and Cassidy are true to their word, and why would villains lie? All they have to do is win and they will save their friends. From Moss Deep, they are only one ferry away from the island where these final tournaments will be held. Unfortunately, there are a lot of trainers and coordinators looking to go to the same place. Apparently, ferry tickets are sold out everywhere. Luckily for our heroes, a familiar face is here to give them a ferry ride. The mustached ferry captain who took them to Petalburg Woods. He's coincidentally here and offers them a free ride straight to the tournaments. He only has one other passenger, who happens to also be a familiar face. The coordinator, Casey. Jessie's pretty surprised Casey qualified for the Grand Festival, considering how badly she's done in the contest so far. But everyone has off days. James and Jesse agree, and they take the ferry across the misty waters. Only Meowth is suspicious of how perfect the situation is. After a relatively short trip, James, Jesse, Meowth, Casey, and the ferry captain arrive at the island where the Grand Festival and Evergrand Conference will be held. The Grand Festival is first, and Jesse has to head to the admin building to register, but all three of them feel something off about this island. There are trainers and coordinators everywhere, but they don't recognize anyone from past tournaments or contests. Jesse thought for sure Whitney, Wallace, and maybe Will would be here. Plus, all of the stands and buildings seem... empty? Hmm, well, maybe they're just early. Jesse heads into the admin building to register, and James and Meowth wander around for a bit. They'll meet up later. But as James and Meowth wander around, James can hear something. Something familiar. In the foggy distance, James can see a silhouette that tells him exactly what is making that noise. The same noise he heard back at Lake May. It's a Gyarados. And not just any Gyarados. This is HIS Gyarados. James runs towards the silhouette by the water, with Meowth running after him. Meowth can tell that this isn't right though, and when James gets close, he knows why. It isn't Gyarados, but a Gyarados-shaped robot. What? what is this? Some kind of mech? What's going on here? And James gets his answer. All of the trainers around him remove their disguises and reveal they are all Team Rocket agents. 
Casey and the fairy captain approach too and remove their disguises to reveal they are Butch and Cassidy. To infect the world with devastation. To blight all peoples in every nation. To denounce the goodness of truth and love. To extend the happy cat. <gasps> Welcome to the end of your journey, little champion, Cassidy says to James. What are you two doing here? Oh, we've been keeping an eye on you two for a while now, waiting for the perfect time to strike. Strike? What What do you mean? We had a deal. We still have time to win the Grand Festival and the Ever Grand- Oh, please. You think we would actually give you a chance to win? We were just hoping you'd catch a bunch of new strong Pokemon for us to steal again. James reaches for a Pokeball, ready to fight to protect his friends. You'll never steal more of my Pokemon. Oh, James, when will you learn? Team Rocket doesn't play fair. All of the Rocket agents laugh, and Butch takes out a switch. Bye, loser. He presses the switch, and James and Meowth realize they were lured to this specific spot by the Gyarados mech on purpose. The ground releases beneath them, and they fall into a giant pitfall trap. The two fall and fall underground, trapped in Team Rocket's secret Hoenn base. James, meow, where did everyone go? Hello, Jesse. Uh, Aston, what are you doing here? This is gonna sound crazy, but we were hiding on that ferry. We've been tracking Team Rocket for weeks now. Don't be alarmed, but this isn't the Grand Festival. Team Rocket's hidden base is underneath this secret island. W what? What are you saying? And what do you mean, we? Stepping out from behind Aston, a trainer, Mr. Stone's son, steps forward. Hello, Jesse. My name is Steven. Aster and I have been working with the Hoenn police for some time. Today is the day we send Team Rocket blasting out of Hoenn. What do you say, Jesse? Want to help us defeat Team Rocket and save your friends? Let's take them down.